Audio Jungle. Hello, my name is Howard Cook. I'm the owner of Bay Area Retrofit. That's a local contracting company, and I've been doing this for 25 years. And I'm going to talk to you about retrofitting apartment buildings. Now, there's some apartment buildings you're familiar with, I'm sure, called soft stories, but there's also other uh, types of apartment buildings that need different types of retrofits. So first, we're going to go over cripple wall retrofits, then we're going to go over no cripple wall retrofits, then we're going to go to hillside home retrofits, and then we're going to go over soft story retrofits. So uh, we're going to go over all those things uh, right now. It's the geology that makes all of this important, and I want to show you what the historical record tells us. So between this large earthquake and this large earthquake, it was 183 years. Now between this large earthquake and this large earthquake, it was 158 years. And then between this large earthquake and this large earthquake, it was 153. And then from this earthquake to this earthquake, 97. And then from this earthquake to this earthquake, 142. Now, I'd like to point out that right now we are actually at 153 years and counting, meaning it's been 153 years since we had the last big earthquake in 1868. So what that means is we've now exceeded this 142. We've exceeded this 97. We're on a par with the 153. We're almost at the 158 and the 183. Oh, it's, it might be 30 years. So what that's showing us is, you know, a big earthquake is certainly, you know, on the horizon. And all of us may go through it. In fact, a good, good chance we're going to go through it because it is so likely according to what geologists tell us. Here is a study made by the Association of Bay Area Governments where they looked at the housing stock here in the San Francisco Bay Area to figure out how many people are going to be displaced. And at the same time, they had to look at the housing stock to see what kind of damage there would be because that defined how many people would be displaced. And multifamily dwellings, uh, as you have, are part of that. So look at this report and see what it has to say about multifamily dwellings and earthquake damage. So right here we see that it's for Alameda County. And we come down here and we see that there will be a total of 82,563 dwellings. So that means, you know, apartments, houses, everything. However, if you come down here and look at this, this is what's really shocking. is 37% of Alameda County's multifamily housing stock will be deemed uninhabitable. So that's pretty significant. Uh, that's a huge, huge uh, segment of the housing stock. And the reason these cities, including Albany, Berkeley, Oakland, San Francisco, they're aware of this statistic. And they're trying to protect the public. They're trying to protect you. They're trying to protect the public. They're trying to protect everybody because this problem with the uh, multifamily housing stock is so significant that there's a big need to prepare for it. At the same time, I'm sure as a apartment owners, you're concerned about the people who live in your homes. And 204,497 people, and those include the people who live in your buildings, are going to be displaced. And this could all be prevented by a good seismic retrofit. When I was working for the Federal Emergency Management Agency after the 1989 earthquake, uh, I had to document damage and I also had to talk to people who had lost their homes. And this right here, this tent city, you would have to call it, it was there for a couple months. So when people are displaced like that, it really puts them to a major inconvenience. The first type of retrofit we're going to look at is the cripple wall retrofit. Now this building, the foundation is right here. The floor is right here, and this wall right here is the cripple wall, and they tend to collapse in earthquakes, and we're going to see how to prevent that. So right here on the right, we have a duplex that has a cripple wall, and the way you tell if you have a cripple wall is you have a number of steps that go up to the front door. And what that means is right here, see the foundation will be right here, the floor that you walk around on will be right here, and there's a wall right here, and that is the cripple wall. Now the same thing over here. If you come over here, you'll see that the foundation is down right here, and then there's this wall in between the floor and the foundation, and that right there is the cripple wall. 
Here is the floor that you would walk around on, and this right here is the cripple wall. Now what happens is they collapse. So here we see the cripple wall standing. This is no earthquake here. And then over here, it starts to shake and the cripple wall starts to lean. And then over here, it leans even more. And then finally, the whole thing falls off the foundation. So right here, you can see how the cripple wall collapsed. This is the cripple wall. Here is the foundation. And what happened is the floor rocked back and forth and caused the cripple wall collapse. This is a photograph of an apartment building that uh, had a cripple wall collapse. So right here is the original foundation. And then what happened, the cripple wall collapsed and the whole building slid over, oh, about two feet uh, when it collapsed. Here's an example of another cripple wall collapse. I was actually the FEMA inspector on this house. And, you know, it looks pretty good on the outside. Notice that the windows aren't even broken. But on the inside, it was completely trashed. Cripple walls are pretty easy to reinforce. So all you need to do is put in some plywood. Here is the floor that you walk on. And again, this is the cripple wall itself. And then this is the foundation. As earthquake forces come this way, they try to knock the cripple wall over like you see here. And all you need to do is put in some plywood and just make sure it's nailed properly, done in a very effective way. And that's all you need to do to keep the cripple wall from collapsing. Now that we brace the cripple wall with plywood, we need to make sure it doesn't slide on top of the foundation and we do that with bolts. So right here, this is the cripple wall and this is the base of the cripple wall and that sits on top of the foundation. So we need to bolt that to the foundation. Now if we don't do that, let me show you what happens. So this cross hatch right here, that's a piece of plywood, that's a piece of plywood to make sure the cripple wall doesn't collapse. Now what happens is the earthquake happens, the, it starts to shake back and forth, it starts to slide off the foundation shakes a little more, it starts to slide off even more, and eventually the whole thing slides off the foundation simply because it didn't have any bolt to attach the plywood and a cripple wall to the foundation. This is what bolts do. So right here is our cripple wall. This is the bottom of the cripple wall. That's the same as what you see right here. Now, all we do to prevent this from happening, where the cripple wall is sliding on top of the foundation, is we just simply just put in some bolts. So this uh, bolt right here attaches this piece of wood here called a mud seal to the foundation, and now the cripple wall is bolted to the foundation. So right now we've got it bolted right here, base of the cripple wall, and this cripple wall right here is braced with plywood, but if we don't make another connection, we're gonna have a lot of damage. So right here, you see this is the braced, uh, this is the braced cripple wall with plywood. It's bolted to the foundation here and here. And what happens is the earthquake happens and then look, the plywood and the bolts stay where they're supposed to be, but if you don't attach the house to it, then the whole house can come sliding off with, like that. And we fix that with something called shear transfer ties. So this is done with something called shear transfer ties, which I just mentioned. So here's the floor that you walk on. And this board right here is called a floor joist. And what happens is earthquake forces come here. They try to push the floor joist off the top of the cripple wall. And we need to make sure that doesn't happen. And what we do, we simply put in some pieces of steel right here and here and here to connect the joist to the top of the cripple wall. And we're all done. Let's do a quick review. So first thing we do, we put in the plywood to keep the cripple wall from collapsing. Then we put the bolts in at the base of the cripple wall to keep it from sliding. And then finally we put in the shear transfer ties to keep the floor from sliding on top of the cripple wall. So when we're all done, you'll see all the components that look like this. Right here is the plywood. This is the cripple wall. And then these are the bolts. Now any retrofit you might do on one of your buildings should contain all these things. So if you have a contractor and he's gonna say, well, I'm gonna bolt that, you know, the building, and he doesn't put in the plywood and he doesn't put in the shear transfer ties, he's not doing any good. He's just keeping the piece of wood that's on the foundation from moving. So every single retrofit, whether it's an apartment building or a house, whatever it is, will have all three components that you see here. As I mentioned earlier, there's a lot of damage that occurs to the inside of a building. So here you can see all how the plaster all fell off the walls. And what you don't see is the plumbing was all torn out, the electrical was all torn out, and it's a big, big mess. There's a lot of damage here. And sometimes it's just not worth rebuilding. It's so expensive to rebuild this sort of thing that uh, it sometimes it's just cheaper and faster. One of the things that happens after an earthquake is contractors come in from all over the country 
and then their prices are triple or quadruple of what they would normally be because they know you know there's a there's a big demand people need to get their apartment buildings you know back in back going they need to get their income you know they they know that they got you under a barrel so that's one of the reasons why retrofitting a building with a cripple wall is a good idea now the way you know if you have a cripple wall or not is simply by how many steps go into the front door so if you have three uh, or more you know more than three steps you probably have a cripple wall and might want to look into this type of retrofit in seismic retrofitting, it's good to be aware that there is no building code for seismic retrofitting. It's also true that there is no special licensing. So what can happen is you can hire someone with very little experience, very little training, and do something that has nothing to do with resisting earthquakes. So for example, if I were to go to the building department and I said, okay, I'm gonna install this hardware and it's made to resist hurricanes and not earthquakes. I could go in, they would issue me a permit, and what they do is they actually don't even allow you to say seismic retrofit on the permit itself. You can say install shiny hardware, you can say uh, voluntary upgrade, but you can't say it's retrofitted because when the earthquake hits, they don't want you to go back and say, hey, you know what, you said it was retrofitted because they didn't say it was retrofitted. All they said was they were gonna allow you to put shiny hardware under the house. So you gotta be really careful about that. If you had your building retrofitted already, you would really want someone to go over there and check it out and make sure it was done properly. And the, you know, the three principles that we looked at, bolting, plywood, and the shear transfer ties, those minimum uh, elements should be there. So this is a word of caution. When you hire someone, make sure that you're well uh, educated in the field yourself and so that when you interview a contractor, you can get a sense whether they know what they're doing or not. I happen to be on a building code committee right now trying to do something about the building code aspect of this but we're not really having any luck. And I really hope to push for contractor licensing because that's really what's needed. Mm -hmm.